Test, test, test. All right, so we have some audio. And let me turn on the chats. Where did they go? Comments and reactions. Hi, everybody. So today we are going to sit at my desk because of my back. <laughs> uh, I hope that you don't mind. I just did not have the desire to set everything up in front of the aquarium today. I just wanted to get into the topic. I wanted to be on time. As usual, I'm fashionably late. And I do apologize that you had to wait a little bit. All right, so today's topic is gonna to be about salt mixes because I feel like that's an important topic that we don't talk about enough. So basically sit back, learn, and hopefully you'll find this beneficial to you. Basically, I wanna tell you how to use salt mix in the proper way to where you won't have any ugly surprises. And I can tell you this because myself, I've never had ugly surprises because I stayed on top of it. But I do want to acknowledge a bunch of you people that are here. So, Mateus, Click Clacks Reef, James Geyer, Sean, Debbie, Chi Town. All right, Chicago's representing. Hank is, he Hank is here, Reef and Dive, uh, Elmer, Corey. Oh, okay, there's a whole bunch. I can't even keep up. It keeps coming in. <laughs> but hey, everyone, I am really glad to be back. So, I want to talk about salt because if you do it incorrectly, if you don't install the, or if you don't mix it properly, if you don't test it, things are going to happen and it's really going to be your fault as an end user. And so let me, let me just kind of go into it. There are probably 15, possibly 20 brands of salt that you can buy around the world. And, you know, we have probably 10 types we can get here in the U.S. I have used about seven types of salt over the last 21 years. And no matter what brand I used, they all have, the thing is they're not all made equally, but they all have the majority of what you need. And so once you mix up a batch, you need to test it. And that's what I want to talk about because it's so easy to say, well, I bought this brand new bucket. I know it's not old. You pop the lid for the first time, you scoop out a half a cup per, um, is it a half a cup per gallon? I've made so much salt. <laughs> I've made so much salt in such giant quantities, it's hard to remember a small quantity. I think it's a half a cup per gallon. And uh, the stir it up, water looks clear, and you're thinking, okay, let me do a water change without verifying what you actually got. So the three things I tell everyone to do is to get uh, the temperature, to match your tank and to get the salinity to match your tank. And the third thing, the most important thing, is to measure your pH of the new salt water versus the pH of the current water in your aquarium. If you can match those three, temperature, salinity, and pH, you can do as big a water change as you want without hurting your livestock. So what happens? Why do people have problems? Uh, well, the main reason is because they, like I said, they trust the bucket, they trust the brand, they don't verify the numbers. Like, we verify everything. Every drop of RODI water, we measure the TDS, and we make sure it always says zero. And if it even goes slightly up, people start losing their minds, and they say it's time to replace the membrane. you got to throw away the filters. You need 14 DIs in a row, when probably all you need to do is change out one or two filters, and you're good to go. But when it comes to salt mix, there's a big trust quotient that needs to be canceled. It needs to be that you measure. So what I generally recommend that you do is take a brand new box, bucket, barrel of salt, whatever you're gonna, you know, whatever you've purchased, crack the lid, mix up a small amount, maybe five gallons, and measure everything. Don't just measure the three. Measure alkalinity, measure calcium, measure magnesium, uh, measure potassium if you can do that. Um, check phosphates, check nitrates, check everything. That way you know what's in the brand new batch of salt water. And you can say for yourself, well, no wonder my magnesium never comes down. This brand always mixes up at 1500 PPM, or it always mixes up at 1600 PPM. One of the brands of salt I used for three years had 1600 from the very first bag until the last bag I used it. And my tank never needed to be dosed magnesium because it, I started that tank with that salt. So my 1600 measurement was forever. And then when I changed brands, that other brand had a much lower uh, magnesium level. And so my magnesium came down to my tank with each water change I did thereafter. So 
that's just one example. Now let me let's talk about worst case scenario. Let's talk about a brand of salt that this was about 15 years ago. And Kent Sea Salt was widely purchased across the nation. And I, I've got an article about this I've mentioned in the past, but some of you are new, so we're going to do the story again. The salt brand that went out, you know, I had six buckets of it in my garage, and I would mix it up as needed, and I would measure. And it was, I think it was winter time when this happened, maybe November, December, and I had my barrel of salt water in the kitchen because I like to mix my salt water inside the house where the temperature is good and I can keep track of the water and nothing can crawl in or land in it. You know, I keep it clean. And I measured and the pH was crazy low. Now, this is the one thing I did want to share with you guys. I did not pull it up first. Let me see if I can get that for you really quick. And let's, uh, all right, I'm looking at the prices of these. And the best deal I found is on saltwateraquarium.com. Let me throw this on the screen. Let me find my projector thingy. <coughs> Move this up. And let's see if this works. All right, so I highly recommend the American Pinpoint pH monitor. This device, this one's 90 bucks, um, and it is such a good tool that I feel everyone should own this if you're gonna measure pH and you don't own a controller. So, plus, if you own a controller, usually those probes are inside your system and you're not moving them. So I would highly recommend that you get this pinpoint meter that is portable, runs with a nine volt battery, and you can put it in your barrel salt water, you can put it in your tank, you can put it in your sump, you can measure everywhere and see what the pH level is. It's instant results. So highly, highly recommend that one to you guys. Um, <clears throat> now, with the American Pinpoint meter, I was able to ascertain that my pH was crazy low. I mixed up some baked baking soda, which is soda ash, with some water, poured it in there, and measured again. And because the the pinpoint meter measures constantly. You could just leave it in there basically, add some in there and wait five minutes and see what the number is. And once my water was around 8.2, 8.3, I just went and did my water change and didn't know any better. I just was like, huh, I guess I have a lot of trapped CO2 in my house. I did not know that the brand of salt was bad. So what was wrong with it? Well, I got a phone call from a fish store owner in Arkansas and he says, Mark, do you use Kent Sea Salt? And I said, yeah, of course I have been using it forever. And he said, have you tested it? And I was like, well, I just did some water changes. And he said, I need you to mix up a batch and test it immediately and call me back. So I did. And when I measured it, the alkalinity of that brand new batch of salt water I mixed up, that five gallons, was one DKH. One. We want it to be between eight and 11. And this was one. <laughs> Super low, which explained why my pH was so low. And when I added the baked baking soda or the soda ash, to the water, I raised the alkalinity up where it belonged, and when I did my water change, the tank didn't even skip a beat. So I called him back and I told him what I discovered, and he says, I knew it, I knew it, I'm so upset, and he was furious. He says, I have an 800 gallon reef in my reef tank in my store, and it's been going downhill, and I keep changing water repeatedly, and the more I change it, the worse the tank got, and I couldn't understand it, and finally I said to myself, I need to go back to the basics. I tell my customers, test everything. So he started testing everything, and he discovered that his brand new salt mix had no alkalinity in it, and that's why his reef was dying, because every time he did a water change, he added to the problem. So the reason that he didn't discover it sooner is because he doesn't measure, or he did not at that time, measure the salt water for alkalinity or for pH. And so he just thought, tank's not doing well, let me do a big water change that'll help it, trusting that the salt mix was good. So that's why I was saying, when you open up a box or a bag or a bucket for the very first time, test it and then mark your bucket on the side that you've tested it or you know, give yourself some kind of clue, especially if you have multiple boxes or bags or buckets on hand, because you wanna say, well, this batch I know is good. And the next one I open is a mystery box and we wanna make sure that it's good as well. Now, that is one example of one thing that can go wrong with a brand of salt mix. The other thing that a lot of people talk about is that the salt mix needs to be tumbled or stirred, and most people don't do that. You buy a, ba a batch of salt, you just scoop in there and you use what you need from the top and you work your way down. A few people will actually go outside with their bucket of salt and they roll it around the yard hoping to get all of the contents remixed. 
because the theory is, is that as the buckets of salt are sitting on pallets in the back of trucks, they're shaking. And as they shake, they just settle. And all the, the theory is that some of that stuff settled to the bottom. So as you get to the bottom of the bucket, we could say the salt mix is more potent than what it was at the top. Uh, I don't know that I believe that, but I mean, I'm not gonna say it's crazy because it's very likely a possibility. So if you could mix up your brand of salt with a stick, a paddle, a, 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 you know, some kind of a, a mixing blade that isn't made of metal that could chip off into your salt mix, you know, that's something you could do. But just testing it is your best bet. And if you want, you could even measure when you get to the bottom of the bucket and see if the testing's any different from the first, you know, and if it was different, then let me know. <laughs> I'd love to hear it. Now, you've done all this testing you are trusting that one batch you can now do water changes on a regular basis but i still recommend temperature salinity and ph must match your tank be within one point you know just as precise as you can be so you can safely do a water change and your livestock won't care if you want to speed up a water change because you don't like your livestock being out of salt water you can pump the water out and pump the water back in and that's very rapid and so your corals won't be exposed very long to air if uh, you have anemones, they'll all hang down low. LPS corals will kind of dangle their flesh. And we don't want you know, to have the coral possibly tear itself from the, weight, the water weight within, of its, within, it, within its polyps. So that's an important one. Now, what's another thing can do to your tank um, that you would think your salt water is fine, but it turns out something got you? The one thing most none of us ever measure when it comes to RODI water as well as salt water is ammonia we assume the brand new batch is good. There was a club member here in my town who lived in a subdivision of homes and there was a new subdivision of homes being built. And when they installed all the plumbing, what they did was they backwashed all the plumbing to get it ready for human habitation with ammonia. And when they did that, that ammonia got into her drinking water, went right through her filters, went right through her membrane because it was so high. And her, she was actually making RODI water with ammonia and doing water changes. And the more changes she did, the more she killed her tank. And she didn't discover it until she measured the tank and saw the ammonia was crazy high. Then she checked the salt water and saw it was crazy high. And then she contacted the city and, and raised hell and, and probably sued them for all I know. And you know they replaced something and then they did it to her again. And she said, from this day forward, every time I make RODI water, I measure ammonia. So do most of us do that? No. And you could have a perfectly good salt mix, but maybe some construction in your area is affecting the source water, gets into your water, you do your water change and your tank declines, and that was something that was kind of beyond your control because that's not a normal thing we would look for. So it's good to know that you should check for ammonia as well when you're doing some water tests. And lastly, the third thing that can get into your water that's relatively toxic and that could happen with a brand new water change is copper. And copper is so bad for invertebrates, it just kills them. <laughs> so we highly recommend never using brass fittings on RODI water. We don't wanna have any kind of copper fittings on the end of the hose you use to pump the water into your tank, you know, because that's a nice cutoff or it looks pretty or whatever. Nope, we want all plastic parts whenever we use our plumbing. Now, another hobbyist, uh, she ran a business out of Dallas and the city replaced the meter in front of her property. And when they did that, they sweated in all new copper. And I guess from the sweating, that copper went right through the RODI system and it went into her water. And as she was doing water changes and probably even top off, she was losing invertebrates left and right. I mean, she lost something like 50, 60, 70 cleaner shrimp, for example, which is expensive. And it took her a minute to figure out what had happened. And then she realized it was because the city changed the meter. It affected the source water it got through into her salt water and like I was saying, possibly her top off water and was constantly adding copper, which put a decline on the, on the entire system. And she had to deal with you know, a rescue operation. So these are some of the things you wanna consider. You, and I'm gonna kind of recap it really quick again to make sure I don't leave anything out. Uh, I told you what the three to test for. I told you that you could possibly mix up the powders to make sure it's completely all the same batch. Um, you wanna definitely check your water completely at least on the first opening of the box and then another thing that you can do is you can look around on the web and see if anyone is reporting an issue 
and the Kent Sea Salt, <laughs> that thing went viral. And that was before we had viral. <laughs> it was on the forums, it was nationwide. Um, the, the company was sending out replacement salt. They basically asked all of us to send them one pound of salt to have them verify it was the bad batch and then they just replace your entire batch, whatever it was you had. And so I sent them six one pound bags and they sent me six brand new buckets. And they even told me, you can still use the old salt, you just have to add the alkalinity. But I decided that wasn't worth the effort for me and I just felt better just getting rid of it. So it went to the trash and I used the brand new buckets that I received with no surprises. Uh, another brand that I see a lot, I don't understand it, you know, because there's so many brands on the market. Um, you've got Instant Ocean's been around forever. Monster bags, I think they're 2,000 pounds each, go to places like SeaWorld, uh, go to places like Georgia Aquarium. Um, I've seen them at uh, Loveland in Utah. There's just these monster bags. They're using Instant Ocean and they have reef tanks. <laughs> they have huge mammals too. And they have you know sharks and they have uh, upside down jellyfish. And you know they have all kinds of cool critters and they're using Instant Ocean. Uh, one of my friends used Instant Ocean forever. And the only reason he stopped is because he could no longer get it in his area. He was at the point now where he had to buy something different. I used Instant Ocean in the very, very beginning. Uh, probably because that's what I used as a kid when I helped my dad with his tank. Uh, and then I think I went from that to Kent Sea Salt. From Kent Sea Salt, I went to Red Sea. Uh, I briefly tried out Oceanic Salt. Didn't like it, stopped using it. Um, then I went to, <clears throat> oh, Saibon, which was something made in China and I had a pallet of it. So it took me a long time to burn through it. That was three years worth of salt. And then I used um, Fritz, I used Aquavitro, I used Fritz again, I used Aquavitro again because I always get these giant barrels that makes a thousand gallons of water. And as you guys know, I don't do a lot of water changes. So in theory, <clears throat> I never use any salt, <laughs> but I do from time to time. And actually it's one of my projects this week is to get the plumbing fixed on the saltwater vat, get the new pump installed that I've had sitting here for a month and a half and start making salt water because I have no safety net. If something goes wrong with my tank right now, I have no salt water. I'd have to, I'd have to panic and call the fish store for help or something because I wouldn't be able to make it fast enough. So I need to get that resolved because that, you know, not having a safety net is really stupid. And with all these different salts I mentioned, um, <laughs> I remember one, <laughs> okay. You know how cheap we can be at times? I mean, we're like, no, seriously, I am not gonna waste this. When I went to Macna one year, I don't know, it was probably eight years ago, nine years ago, every single person was given a 50 pound or 50 gallon bag of salt. So a big plastic bag of salt, it was really heavy. And I threw that thing in my suitcase. I'm not wasting it. And people are like, you're gonna take that on the plane? And I was like, salt is salt, I'm not gonna waste it. So I put this big bag in my suitcase and I flew home. And when I opened the suitcase, there was salt everywhere. What had happened was inside the suitcase, there's these metal clips that hold the fabric in the corners. And somehow the clip had snagged the bag and tore it open. And my clothes were full of salt. Everything I owned was full of salt. The suitcase was full of salt. I ended up having to throw away the suitcase because it was, the zipper was eroding. <laughs> it was getting destroyed. And I was like, all of this for a free bag of salt that I was determined to bring home, I'm an idiot. So I don't recommend coming home with salt in your luggage. Um, you just don't do it. It's just not worth it. Give it to somebody that, that's local that can drive home and use it, you know, but uh, yeah, sometimes uh, great ideas don't work out so well. Now, let me think, what else can I tell you? All right. Um, okay, someone mentioned, I, 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 I've been kind of ignoring the comments. I want to stay on topic. I did pretty good. I went almost 20 minutes straight. <laughs> so let's see. <laughs> All right, let's throw this on the screen. Rosano says, my salt is very low in magnesium. What is the number? That's what you want to know. If it's 1100, then you're going to need to buffer it up. One of the products that I use myself is called Magnesium Pronto. I sell it on my website, it's 20 bucks. One jar will make something like five gallons of liquid magnesium. It's fantastic. I've been using it for several years. I just mix up a gallon, well, not even a gallon. I have a very specific recipe. If you want it, let me know. I'll give you the exact numbers. And you just mix it up and you hook up a dosing pump and you let it just dose into your system. You could determine how much you need through math <laughs> and in every batch. So like, let's say you make a trash can of water that holds, 
let's say 30 gallons of water, you could determine I need two tablespoons of magnesium pronto with every batch of salt I mix. And that way, every time you do it, it just works. So that is another way of handling it rather than putting in salt mix with a depleted uh, element that would then affect your tank temporarily while you're trying to bring it back up. So try to get everything in the barrel correct before it goes in your system if you can. All right. Joseph asked, have you tried Aquachar yet? No, I did not because uh, I think the pouch said it was good for 25 gallons and I have 450 and I didn't come home with like 15 bags of it. But I saw a couple of people posting, they were really happy with it. When I looked at it, the first thing I looked, I thought of was charcoal, like for grilling. And I was surprised that that was their carbon. So I, I don't know anything else. I just know they're new to, uh, they're new to me. I assume they're new to the industry. It was interesting. Mina, hi. She's uh, reaching us from Sydney. That's pretty awesome. All right. The audio is a little bit low. Want it a little louder? Let me see what I can do here. Let me bump this up a hair. So we'll see what that does. Uh, thanks for letting me know. Let's see. <laughs> uh, Reefer Madness, I will never start on time, no matter how hard I try. Hi, Raj. I see he snuck in here. All right. Oh, interesting. I don't know. I haven't heard. So what were the results? Somebody tell me. Um, I'm looking for questions. <clears throat> While you're paused, I could definitely say if you're not a subscriber to this channel, subscribe so you get notifications about the live streams. Make sure you click the bell because apparently the bell will give you the notification, the push notification on your phone. Now here's the downside of the bell. If you have uh, 15 channels you subscribe to and you have the bell turned on for all of them, you might get so many notifications from all these different channels that you're like, oh, so you, you just tell your app, stop sending notifications and you get none. You can't just say, I only want one from Mark, for example, or I only want one from Reef Dudes or Inappropriate Reefer. You're going to get it from all of us or none of us. I think the cure would be not to push the bell on the other channels you're bookmarked to, and that way you um, only get those a few. You get less. So that might be a solution, possibly. All right, um, Antonio made the comment. I wanted to throw this on the screen. Um, the, you can inhale problems around salt mixes, and that is completely true. That is a dangerous thing that can happen, and it's very important that you don't inhale the dust as you're mixing your salt. When you make your, your mix, your batch, and you're pouring in, actually, if you're scooping out of a big container, you're going to create kind of a dust, and you could suck that in your lungs, and then you can pour it into the container, and again, dust rises. So kind of be aware that your mouth is closed when you're mixing salt, that you're not taking deep in inhalations. That, that would be dangerous. And you want to make sure that uh, you don't get any of it in your eyes. Uh, that, that was something. I remember someone had a salt mix. It was a club member. And their eye turned like Halloween blood red. I was like, wow. And it was from working with salt mix. Some of it spattered in that person's eye. So, you know, be careful when you're mixing. And we also want to calibrate our device that measures salinity to make sure it's accurate. So I sell a product called Accuracy on my website that is 35 ppm or 35 ppt um, of uh, salt water. So you can actually put it on your refractometer and dial your refractometer to 35 ppt. Now they match. And then whenever you mix a batch of salt water, you can then be close to the target range. If a lot of people, calibrate with RODI water, which is the wrong end of the scale. It's so far away from what we care about that it can skew the results. So I always tell everyone to calibrate with 35 PPT. Now, if you don't want to do that, if you say, nope, I'm absolutely going to use RODI water. I've used it my whole life, and that's the only way I'm going to do it, you can keep doing it. And then what you could do is put the 35 PPT solution on your lens and make sure it says 35. And if it doesn't, I was right, or you need to adjust your refractometer because you didn't quite get it right when you did your, your method with RODI water. But you definitely want to make sure that your salinity is accurate. But then that's what I'm saying. So you measure your tank with a refractometer, even if the refractometer is wrong. Let's say you're off by two points. 
So you measure and it's 1.023, and then you measure your salt mix and it's 1.020, or it's 0.17, or it's 1.029, you know, it's too high. So you wanna make sure that they match. Now, if it's too high, you add more RODI water and you keep diluting it till you get it to the right amount. If it's too low, you need to add more salt mix. So what I was saying is if your refractometer is wrong, it's gonna be wrong on both, so they'll still match. But eventually you've got to get it accurate to know what your tank is doing. I talked to someone two days ago. He's a young hobbyist. He's made a share of mistakes. And here's one I'd never heard of, and I'm not throwing him under the bus. I'm not saying his name, but he accidentally misunderstood how to use calibration solution. And so he used 35 PPT solution. He put it on his refractometer and he adjusted the refractometer to 1.035. And so his salinity was way wrong, way low, and everything he kept putting in the tank kept dying. And he couldn't understand why, because everything measured right. And it was because he had calibrated incorrectly. And he only later discovered on his own that 35 PPT should match 35 PPT on the refractometer, not 1.035. And I, like I said, that's the first time I've ever heard anyone do that. I'm not saying others haven't, but that was a new one to me. And I was like, well, I'm really glad he figured it out. And now he's got corals in his tank and things are doing better and he's happy. <laughs> so that's a good thing. But yes, we definitely want to calibrate that. With the American pinpoint meter I mentioned to you, you're going to have to replace the pH probe from time to time. It'll last a good long time. Um, I used to use it on my 55 gallon aquarium way back in the day. And I would leave it in the sump at all times and turn it on. Every time I opened the door, I just saw the pH and I closed the door and that was it. And then when I had to do a water change, I would remove it from the 55 and I'd go stick it in my barrel and I'd check. And then I'd stick it in my 29 gallon and I'm like, okay. And then I'd put it in my 55 and I would look and again, compare. And that was a really handy tool. So I highly recommend it way more than pH strips or pH test kits. I never liked those. The American Pinpoint, that's what I recommend. So that one, like I said, I found you guys a great deal. They're on Amazon. Uh, I found it on Saltwater. I found it on Saltwater Aquarium. I found it on BRS. I mean, uh, Marine Depot would have it, Premium Aquatics. Everyone's going to have it. But uh, get one of those. You'll do yourself a favor. It's totally worth owning that. All right. Oh, by the way, I wore this shirt for this topic today because we're like, salt? <laughs> And I just thought, this is a good one, because a lot of people like to debate, this brand is great, this brand sucks. All right. Let's see. I'm not going to tackle that. I'm trying to stay on salt topic right now, so I'm skipping a question here. Um... When it comes to your salt mix, you also want to make sure that it doesn't turn to stone. So be sure you keep it sealed. If you're getting plastic bags, I would then, you know, fold the plastic bag, roll it over, tape it shut to keep any moisture from getting in and turning it to rock. I have found that when you take salt that has turned to stone and you try and break it up, it never dissolves properly. I think there's a chemical reaction that happens and it kind of ruins it. It's almost better to take the bricks, you know, the, the chunks out and just toss them and use what you have left and learn from that mistake, don't do it again. I've never tried to do anything crazy like use desiccants inside my salt mix to keep it dry. But in the, like the big batches I buy, they're double bagged. And when I'm done scooping all the salt out I need, I then push down on the bag all the way down, down, down and squeeze out all the air and then I twist it and tie it in a knot, and then I take the second bag and I squeeze out all the air. And again, that's another one of those times when you're pushing out all that air, do not inhale. You'll get that stuff in your lungs, you'll get the stuff in your nostrils, you know, don't do that. So make sure that you've got your, all the air out of it as much as you can. With a bucket, you don't have that choice. So just keep the bucket sealed. Don't just lay the lid on top, snap it down, and then pry it open later. And uh, anything else, you know, anyway, that's, that's the ones I recommend. Now, Don says, what about mixing multiple brands of salt mix together? Uh, it's kind of an interesting question. I don't know anyone that's ever done that intentionally, but uh, normally what happens is you were using a certain brand of salt, you're getting low, and it's time to make a new batch and you bought like a new salt. One of the things that has been recommended was when you mix up, you know, let's say your tank is used to Kent sea salt and you're like, now you're gonna use uh, Tropic Marin one of the recommendations is not to just do a, you know, you, you normally do, let's just take a round number. You change a hundred gallons on Saturday 
and every Saturday you do that much. Well, going from this one number, this one brand of salt to a totally different brand of salt could affect your tank adversely. So it's usually recommended to do a few smaller water changes with the new salt mix before you hit it with the big water change. So that would be something that I would advise. Myself, I don't change a lot of water in my tank, but even when I do, I don't change a lot. You know, my, my liquid volume is 450 gallons and I change about 55 gallons. So that's a ninth of, a, of the system. If I was changing 25% or 35% or 40%, uh, I would probably be a little bit more cautious about switching flavors of salt. But I, I typically stick with one brand of salt for whatever reason. I remember when Red Sea Pro was out, I really liked it, but the fish store owner by me stopped selling it and got all of his customers to believe that it was causing cyanobacteria. And I totally disagreed with him. I, he knows this, you know, if he's watching this video, he knows. Um, I was like, there's no way that salt mix creates cyano. <laughs> and just because the name red is in the name doesn't mean it comes with cyanobacteria. But he said, it definitely does. It's happening in all my customers' tanks. It's happening in all my tanks. I changed a lot of water and that's the only thing. And I was like, it's not the salt mix because I use Red Sea Pro. My tank doesn't have any cyano. I do a water change. I don't have cyano. It's like, when does it happen? When you put the new in? Or does it happen with the tank just fermenting with that brand? And I, I just told him, I said, no, you're not right on this one. And, uh, but he stopped selling it and he got all of his customers to switch to reef crystals or something. I was like, all right. But the most likely reason so many people had cyanobacteria around the same time is because it's a seasonal thing and it breaks out in our tanks all about at the same time for a lot of people. And it typically, I believe it's because what happens is the sun changes direction um, for the summer months and then it changes for the winter months. I know that's not the technical way of saying it, but you can see the daylight coming in at a totally different angle. All winter, my front door is just a normal front door. In the summer, that front door is blazing hot because the sun has shifted for the summer solstice and it is, it is just pounding my front door and that door feels like it's melting. And then, you know, like I said, all winter, and I'm not talking about temperature because Texas is always hot, but there's, it's a different angle. The sunlight doesn't hit it directly. And the same thing with how the sunlight comes in the door and hits my reef versus not even coming near the reef is because of the orientation of the planet versus the sun. And so I'm just telling you that it is possible that with a change of how the sun comes in the room, it could actually create a cyanobacteria bloom. It's possible. Uh, James asked me, what salt do you use? I'm using aqua vitro. I still have about a third of a barrel left, which is probably around three, 400 gallons worth of salt water that I'll be able to use. So I've got probably a couple of containers that I can fill up before I have to replace. And I will probably get Fritz Redbox. Redbox is the higher alkalinity. It should be measuring between nine and 11. I think it's around 10. And I like that one. And so I would like to get that. And Fritz is local. So that would be nice. But, uh, and I've used Fritz. I've used Fritz at least on four different occasions, um, which means I mixed up 200 gallons at a time. And I used all that on my system and my, my tank didn't skip a beat, so. Uh, I, yeah, I just answered that one. <laughs> uh, let's see. Jason, I'm just gonna drop you into this conversation really quick. Yes, you should buy an Apex. Guess what? I sell it on Milo's Reef. <laughs> I highly recommend you buy it. So uh, yes, no, the Apex is great for controlling your tank. And I would definitely recommend that you do that because you want to make sure that, oops, sorry. You want to make sure that you know what's going on with your tank around the clock. And I have been running a controller on any tank I own since 2004. And it would be weird to have a tank without one. Even my frag system is tied into my apex to give me temperature and pH results and uh, to control lights and, and to turn on dosers and to run the top off. I mean, it's, yes, I highly recommend it. Alrighty. Oh, good question. How long is a mixed batch of salt good for? I would say months, but there's people out there that will disagree with that. So here's the general rule. When it comes to salt water in a big barrel or in a big poly tank like I have, is that it's constantly circulating all the time. I know some people will put a pump on their saltwater vat and they tell it to turn on like one hour every day 
just to kind of tumble it once. And I just keep it running. I just nonstop, there's a circulation pump, and that way it's fully aerated and good to go. And I have, you know, all, like I said, 55 gallon water change, so it comes down a quarter and then a quarter and then a quarter, and then finally I have the last of it to use up. And that could last me three months. And I can do that and completely have no surprises with my tank. If you aren't storing it in a trash can, if you have it in the jugs, you want to tighten the cap on it. And that kind of salt water is usually good for a month. So I wouldn't want to have it sitting in a, in a jar too much longer after that. Furlox asks, could I buy a salt with elevated levels of calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium and use that with an auto water change system to maintain my parameters? My current salt mix doesn't, salt mix doesn't replenish mine enough with the small water changes. Actually, um, I could see how that could potentially work, but you're going to have to stay on top of testing anyway. So instead, what I would recommend is you know, use a brand that you like, that mixes cleanly that, uh, with your auto water change system, and then just dose what your tank needs, which if you're running a reef tank, you're gonna have to dose alkaline and calcium on a daily basis anyway. And to just say, well, I only put it in once a week, doesn't mean you're doing it the right way. We want that element in our tank all the time. The corals are absorbing it. Matter of fact, we've learned through some science in the last uh, couple of years that more alkalinity is used during the daytime and less is being consumed during the nighttime when the corals are resting. They're not growing during the night like one might think, or they're definitely not absorbing during the nighttime. So uh, dosing more during the daytime and less during the night is something that you could consider doing, but you would need something like a Trident that can give you those results and show you what's happening for you to know, what, you know what's going on. But I definitely would think you need to dose more regularly and not just put it into your water. Some people have also even suggested, can I put what I need to dose in my top off water and just let that go in. But no, I just keep everything separate. You have top off water, you have salt water, you have what you need to dose. That was what I would recommend. And that way you can, you can avoid some kind of a disaster. I, I just feel like combining it all together is just kind of, it becomes risky. Um, what if uh, it changes way too much water at once and the stuff is super alkalinity level? Uh, you know, what would that do to your tank? So I, you know, I wouldn't recommend that. Um, Salty Reef says, why don't you use a hydrometer instead of a refractometer? <laughs> because hydrometers roll off countertops and shatter. And the last time I did that, I stopped buying them. So, <laughs> but yeah, that's another way of measuring. Uh, there's, there's several devices on the market you can use. I just like refractometers. They're pretty accurate. All right. This one I can't answer because I don't know the answer. I don't, I don't know. I've never used, that one brand I've never used is Reef Crystals. I don't know why, I just never have. But, so I don't know the difference between different colors uh, of their buckets. But um, I would, I assume on the packaging, it might say fish only is one color and reef is the other color because Red Sea had a salt and then they had a Red Sea Pro Reef salt. And so I always bought the reef salt. Same with Saibon. Saibon had a fish only, and then they had a reef salt. So I always bought the reef. <clears throat> um, Odie says, or Odalee says, how often do you check your refractometer? I'd say monthly. It's pretty accurate. Um, it does. It takes a few seconds. It's just nice to verify, and uh, that way you you're up to date. And if you if you cannot remember the last time you <laughs> calibrated it, you should calibrate it. I mean, seriously. Tyler says, uh, salt chemistry question. What is considered the balanced? I've heard that your magnesium should be about three times your calcium level. How important is that? Is there a window? Yeah, uh, three times the calcium level is correct. I remember when I said that the first time, people were like, oh, where'd you get that from? And I went back to some ancient article I read in 2002, 2003, <laughs> found the sentence. And I was like, see, a scientist said this. And so I was right. But uh, it, just as a general rule, it's nice to say, well, if your alkalinity, I'm sorry, if your calcium is 400, your magnesium should be 1200. I mean, it's just kind of a thing. 
But like you said, is there a window? Yes, there's a window. 1280 to 1400 for magnesium. Uh, 375 to 450 for calcium. 8 to 11 for alkalinity. These are the windows. And you have to pick a spot in there and stay there. Don't go 11, 8, 11, 8, 11, 8 on alkalinity. We want to be 9, 9, 9, 9.5, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9. 8.5, 9, 9, see what I'm saying? You try and stay in a stable number. With magnesium, that one's not as critical. Um, I've, I've never you know, really worried about magnesium. I put in, when I would dose it to my system, I would dose basically that liquid volume that's almost a gallon. I think a gallon is 128 ounces and I make 120 ounces. So <laughs> that's like he's saying almost a gallon. And uh, I would dose that every single day until the jug was empty. And then a month later, I would dose that jug. And then a month later, I would dose that jug. I mean, that's what I did. I don't have magnesium going in my tank every day, 30 days out of the month. So uh, I found that once you get your magnesium where it belongs, it stays up there a good long time and takes a while for that number to start coming back down again. And it is the most difficult test we usually do. Um, when it comes to do, you know, water testing, magnesium's got the extra steps, seems to take longer than everything else, and we all like, ah, I hate testing magnesium. And the worst part is, if you do it a little bit incorrectly, it can skew your results to the point where you should actually test your water three times for magnesium, which is three times as much work, and then divide by three to get the average number so you can be sure that your number is right. So if you have any doubts about a measurement when you do a water test, test three times and divide by three. Oh, so glad you asked this question, Mateus. He says, uh, how can you limit precipitation when mixing salt? Even when I slowly add salt to my mixing barrel, I get some silt at the bottom. All right, so that was something I did not mention earlier, and it's so important. Um, there are, there's a right way to mix salt, and then there's the not right way to mix salt. <laughs> See, I'm always so positive. You do not want to put the salt in the barrel first and then pour the water on top. You definitely want to have the barrel of water with circulation and then add the salt into that and that way it mixes properly and it can't become super saturated and actually precipitate out. So we wanna make sure that we are putting it in in a gradual fashion, not just slice the bag and dump it in like, you know, kunk, like a brick. We wanna make sure it's trickling in and mixing. I like a nice big strong pump and a barrel of salt water, like a big mag pump that will really create like a, not a cyclone, but you know what I mean, it's going. And then you add the salt and you can see the salt just shooting around in the barrel, that's good. That's what you want. And uh, if you do see a little bit of sediment at the bottom, don't worry about that. It's, it's okay. From time to time, we actually have to clean our containers. <laughs> and that requires scrubbing down the saltwater mixing container. Uh, I was gonna say sanitize. We kind of, at the very least, bleach the jugs that you screw the caps on. Those jugs don't stay clean forever. You're gonna have to take some time every few months to clean your jugs and get them back to pristine again to where if you were to add RODI water and then put a TDS meter in there it should measure zero to one and not be 80 <laughs> because that's just crap in the jug. If your jugs are not nice and clean looking you need to clean them. That's what I was saying use bleach water. So uh, 10 parts water to one part bleach mix that up pour it in slosh it around if you want if you don't want to like fill the thing with five gallons uh, slosh around really good rinse it out really well with tap water, let it aerate outside or dry, I'm trying to say, let it dry for a day so any kind of fumes will evaporate. The best time to do this is spring, summer, and fall. Not so easy in winter when it's really cold out for a lot of you. Um, putting a jug out in the sun in the winter is not gonna do any magic. So uh, I would focus on cleaning your containers and barrels when you have decent weather, when you feel like being out there. At the times you're washing your car, or uh, working in your garden, that's a great time to be cleaning out a saltwater container or a mixing barrel or a poly tank or you know, uh, buckets. <sighs> uh, Mitchell says, what do you think is the best batch size of saltwater to make considering that these machines take forever to fill a five gallon jug? I, by machines, you must mean the RODI system, and a uh, 75 gallon a day RODI system will make three gallons an hour. So that does feel like forever. It takes an hour and uh, 40 minutes 
to make five gallons of water if you have a system like that. If you have a 100 gallon a day system, it can make about 4.16 gallons per hour. If you have 150 gallons a day, that makes about 6.25 gallons per hour, but still pretty slow. You know, you're averaging around 13 to 16 minutes per gallon, and then, you know, you finally got your water saved up. But the question you were saying, what's the best batch size? If you were to run a quarantine tank, and let's say it's a 10 gallon tank, and you are going to put in your brand new fish that you just got from the fish store, and you put it in there, you need to do a water change every single day to keep that tank healthy, because that tank has no bacteria, no live rock, it's just uh, a fish, a hang on back filter, a thermometer, an ammonia alert badge, a light so you can see the fish. Um, so what I recommend in that situation, you would change 10% of the water every single day. 10% is one gallon. So I wouldn't want you to mix up one gallon each day. I would much rather you have like 10 or 20 gallons of water next to the quarantine tank with a circulation pump and a heater to keep it completely stable so it matches the tank. And then when you're done feeding that fish in quarantine, you can actually siphon out the detritus off the bottom of the tank and suck out about a gallon of water and then pump in one gallon of water and you still have nine gallons left and then you have eight gallons left and you have seven. So you can have a week's worth or 10 days worth of water all mixed up in the same batch. So I would recommend that. Uh, for bigger tanks, you know, we're, like for example, when I had my 280 gallon tank, I was changing between 33 and 55 gallons of water at a time. And I typically would make a batch of salt water, do my water change, and then put everything away for, you know, until the next water change. But since I set up the fish room with a 400 gallon reef, I have a huge 265 gallon poly tank and it holds 250 gallons of salt water. The beauty of it is I can mix up a giant batch of salt water and let it go for months. Now, I do want to mention this. I do not want to forget to include this. It's very important. I have this huge batch of salt water I mixed. I measured everything. It was great. Now it's two months old. It's time to measure it again and see where we're at. It's a sealed container. It has circulation. In theory, nothing, nothing should change. But I have literally observed alkalinity drop in salt water that's sitting in a poly tank, even with circulation. And I would have to buffer it up with baked baking soda. And I just do that. I buffer it up with a few teaspoons of what I need. I check it again. Now it's back to matching my tank. And I can go ahead and do my water change and the, the reef doesn't skip a beat. I don't have a few corals turn white, you know, the next day or one of those things. So you definitely want to double check your water that you've had for a duration and see where the status is. You know, make sure it's still the same or if, has anything dropped off that you need to buffer back up and get it back even before you change water in your tank. <clears throat> and I mentioned alkalinity because that's what I measure with that tank rather than measuring pH. But pH and alkalinity are pretty much the same beast when it comes to measurements. If your pH is low, typically your alkalinity is low. When you buffer up the alkalinity, the pH rises to match. So that's why both of those two are good indicators when you're comparing. If you want to compare alkalinity to alkalinity before you do a water change, that's great. If you want to do pH to pH, that's great too. As long as they match, you should be able to do a water change safely. All right. Um, while I'm looking at questions, I'll just tell you guys, I went and saw the surgeon yesterday about my neck and he answered a few of my questions and he said he needs a CAT scan to tell me what to do next. So he wouldn't give me any more opinions because the problem is I have a, a metal disc. See that little slice right there? I have a metal disc inside my neck and the MRI is all magnets and as they spin around the metal thing skews the image. It kind of does that weird warped uh, funhouse mirror effect. So now he needs to see the bones. He's seen the muscles, he's seen the ligaments, <laughs> he's seen, I don't know what else, let's call it nerve endings. I don't even know what they see in those pictures. And uh, now he needs to see the bones and see what's going on there. And then he'll give me a course of treatment. I hopefully will have something I can do to make myself feel better. All right. Uh, just because this is on my screen, I'm gonna throw it on the screen really quick. I seem to have hundreds of bristle worms and they're spawning even. I bought an arrow crab to help. That's, that's the right way to go. An arrow crab and or a long-nosed hawkfish will eat the extra bristle worms that are in your tank, but uh, they won't destroy the entire population. They will just eat it down to a controlled uh, ecosystem, which is completely like the ocean where we don't eradicate something. We just have checks and balances in the ocean and there are predators and there are uh, victim. <laughs> They're the bait. 
and they work. And when you were like, for example, the whole thing with lionfish in Florida, uh, there's no one there that eats lionfish. So they're growing out of control because they don't have a predator in Florida. Wherever they come from, they must have a predator, whatever it is. Um, and uh, they lack that predator in Florida and it's been a big problem. So in your tank, you need a predator to kind of keep the bristleworms under control. And the same thing happened to me. I had a 29 gallon for seven years and I would throw in flake food and I'd see all the worms come out and I didn't care. And one day I had a girl over and she's looking at it and she's like, oh my God, it's disgusting. There's worms everywhere. And when I looked at the tank through her eyes, I said, oh, I see what she's saying. Yeah, there is a lot of them in here. Rather than trying to pull them out one by one with tweezers, I just got the long nose hawkfish and arrow crab and it reduced the population probably by 80%. And then you just see them come out at night like they're supposed to, to eat some waste. So that would be my recommendation. Michael says, does the skimmer take out a small amount of salt water, salt out of the water? It actually takes salt water out of your system. So if you are set up with a reef tank that has an automatic water change system where you pull out, let's just say, five gallons goes out and five gallons goes in every single day like clockwork, but your skimmer is pulling out skimmate, it could actually change the salinity in your tank and it could get lower and lower or it can get higher and higher based on what's happening with your top off system and your skimmer. So, um, if you're um, wet skimming, which is more fluid coming out, you could actually be pulling out salt water. Your top off system is adding fresh water. It's actually making it less and less salty um, over time. So that's one of the reasons we test our salinity every single week. Um, Odalise says, do you have a two-part pump on your site? I sell the Camor X1 pumps, and each one is $60, and you can just get two of them. Uh, you can even daisy chain them together. You can have up to a maximum of four of those pumps going to one power supply. And you control them with your phone. Super nice, it's Bluetooth. So I do recommend that one. That's what I've been using. All right. Do you use the salinity pen by Hannah? <clears throat> I have it, I've been using it. And, um, I think it's pretty accurate. I'm not saying it's deadly accurate. <laughs> it's pretty accurate. And I did put it in 35 PPT solution to see if it would show 35. And uh, I'm trying to remember, I feel like it was really close, like 34.8, you know, it was almost there. And I have to find the manual to see if there's something I can do to, to adjust calibration. I, I remember looking at it. I think I did, I think I hit the calibrate button on it and then had it set to 35 and then I was able to check my tank again. My tank is actually low in salt right now. It's probably around 33.2, 33.3 PPT, which is probably like 1.0245 or 1.0251 or something like that. So it's a little bit low. I'd like it to be 1.026. For luck, I have not done that video yet. That is coming someday when I finally get motivated. Let's see. Mary Reef says, what's the best tips for coloring SPS? And do you, how do you know if it's happy or not? Well, I have an entire live stream video, I'm pretty sure it was live stream, where I talked about what Acropora care needs. And I would definitely say watch that one because there's a lot to take into consideration. But basically very stable water parameters are key. Uh, good lighting spectrum is important, plenty of flow. Um, typically, if a coral's not happy, you should be able to tell you know, it won't grow, it might be stagnant, it might get pale, it might lose tissue, parts of it are dying. I mean, that's all unhappy coral right there. But yeah, I would watch that, that stream, I would check. I have an entire video, it's very popular on that topic. Um, Chris asks, what is your opinion of RPM salt? That's the Fritz salt. Uh, I've used it several times, I like it. I'm probably gonna get the red boxes. Um, Nathan, I'm battling PO4 on a new tank. I'm making my own RODI water and just tested it straight out of the unit and it reads 0.1 to 0.2, same as tap water. I'm also using the API test kit. What can I do? Uh, you're using the API test kit to check for PO4 on deionized water. You're gonna get a false reading as far as I recall. It just seems like you need to take your RODI water, mix it with salt and then check for phosphates and see what you get and hopefully you'll get a nice low number. But I think the DI water throws off the measurement. 
and I'm not even going to say what the API test kit does because I've never used that one for phosphate. I use um, Elos, which is super easy to use. Salifert's another super easy one to use. Uh, I don't know what to tell you here. <clears throat> Vala says, my goby suddenly disappeared for two weeks, but the hole still looks maintained, and there's new gravel piles today. I don't know if I should get a new one or not. The shrimp seems to still be alive, though. Maybe feed your tank and stand back and see if that fish comes out into the open. Typically, the goby is always present because it's alerting the shrimp if there's danger. So if you don't see it with some food, you might need to get a second goby or, or a new goby to go with your shrimp, and hopefully they'll pair up again. Jose, um, no, the brand literally does not matter. Um, what matters is the parameters of the salt mix you're using. So you want to verify. I've heard good things of Aquaforest, so I wouldn't worry. Um, I'm sure you'll be good to go. Just like I said earlier in this video, just make sure you're testing it each time you open up a brand new bucket. All right. Would you recommend using muriatic acid to lower alkalinity within a salt mix? Do you have another method to lower alkalinity? I believe white vinegar will do that. <clears throat> so what is the alkalinity of your mix and how far are you trying to bring it down? That's what I need to know. That's very, I'm curious. Hey, I'm almost to the latest question. I'm actually caught up with you guys. I'm impressed. Um. Oh, Michael says, how is the Clarice going? I've just got mine installed. What's the best water level, higher or lower? I have mine sitting in about this much water, which is probably two and a half inches. Someone said the water level should be to the base of the little door that opens, but I have mine a little bit lower than that, and it's been working just fine. I replaced the roll a week ago, and it's still running. But uh, I, I think that it needs to be higher up out of the water to operate better. And I think when it's submerged deeply in a sump, I don't think it's as effective. Uh, odds are water's pouring out the side. I think it needs that pressure to push out and roll down the walls and go into your sump. But it's dead silent. I mean, it's a great, great gizmo. Uh, Jason asked me if I could put a link on the screen for my website. There is a message and then we'll put this on here right here so milasreef.com right on the front page you'll see um, a few of the items I sell and in the drop down menus there's catalog and you can go there and you can start looking at different areas you got dry goods you've got acrylic work you've got uh, uh, equipment so all that stuff is there and uh, then I ship things out every single day move this down so I can close it <laughs> David says, what did I miss? All right, guys, let's rewind the show. <laughs> James says, I finally got around to dosing Live Rock Enhance. It only took me five months. What should I watch for? You should watch for a cleaner tank. That's what's going to happen. Uh, as you'll dose it, you'll see initially when you put it in the tank, that the water will get cloudy for a few hours. That's the bacteria blooming or hatching, uh, but that cloud goes away. And you'll also see these little orbs bouncing all over the reef. And if you have like me, if you have a leather coral, the leather coral will close up because it's getting pummeled by hail. And uh, it's like, what is happening? And, uh, but then the leather opens up again. And I've used it in my reef. I've used it in my frag system. Uh, I've used it in the anemone cube. And it makes everything cleaner, and the coralline seemed to grow much better after dosing it a few times. Uh, it's not an instant cure. It's one of those things that you use for two or three, four weeks, and then you start to say, so what's the difference? And then you relook your tank, like, oh my god, it's so much better than it was. That's crazy. Um, I, when Live Rock Enhance was sent to me, uh, I, I was like you. I had it for a while. I didn't use it. And uh, Tulio said, Mark, have you tried it yet? I'm like, no. He goes, put it in your tank. I was like, okay. He goes, no, right this second. While I'm on the phone with you, put it in your tank. And I'm like, okay, let me get a cup. He goes, no, don't, no, just get it and put it in your tank. 
I said, well, let me turn off the return pump. He's like, no, don't turn off anything. Just put it in the tank. I'm like, fine. So I open the lid and there's this little bag and I scoop it out and, and I, I did the math and I said, I need nine scoops or 16 scoops or something. And I just put it in the tank and I watch it go right across the top and down the drain. It's like, it's going down the drain. And he says, that's fine. It goes everywhere. It's fine. And uh, that was my first uh, experience using it, which really is a crazy way to try out a new product. And I don't highly recommend that to anyone, but I took a chance because I know Tulio. And uh, a month later, my live rock just looked so much cleaner. And it was after using it on my reef that I thought, you know, I have a theory. If this is good beneficial bacteria, maybe it'll outcompete bad bacteria because I kept hearing that. And so I thought, could I use this in my frag system that had hints of cyanobacteria? There wasn't the blanket, but like the walls would get that pinkish kind of a, you just had a feeling cyanos coming and you could clean off the glass and be good for a few days and it kind of got pink again. And, you're, and I'm not talking about spots like Coraline, more like this reddish hue, you just knew. And I put it in there and it all completely vanished. And that's when I started thinking maybe to get rid of dinoflagellates too. And I started recommending people try it out as well for that. And a few people did and they said it worked. So really neat stuff. But um, you might see coralline flaking off the walls, you know, like it, it becomes so thick. It, I don't know, maybe the bacteria gets behind it and, and just releases it. But I had a couple of big pieces come off in my sump by the return pump and just fell down like a potato chip. So... Andrew says, I'm home now. You can start. <laughs> Will shadowing eventually kill SPS corals? Absolutely, Alex. Uh, you get a big shadow of coral, everything underneath it that's being shaded will start to bleach out and eventually it'll just drop dead. And that's happened to me. Michael says, have you ever used Vibrant? I have not. Alrighty. Um, well, guys, we've been at this for just over an hour. We don't have to keep going today. We can wrap this up a little bit sooner. I'm here to answer a few more questions, but uh, at one point, I'm going to wrap this up because uh, I got some stuff I need to do today. But uh, I, I think this was a good conversation. I hope you liked it. Um, please thumbs up this video. That would be appreciated. And uh, I am hoping to, I keep telling you guys, I'm hoping to get some more of my videos edited and uploaded. And it's just a matter of having the desire to sit at a computer when my back hurts so much. And that's hard. And uh, so I, I kind of like, because I feel like once I start, I'm not going to move and I'm just going to make myself even worse because I'll refuse to get up and stretch or whatever. But at some point, I will definitely tackle these things and start rolling out some videos for you guys because I want them out. I want them off my hard drive. So that part is coming. Arowana asked the question. He says, I just finished filling up my tank with RO water, and so now he wants to add the salt mix directly in the tank to mix it. Is this okay to do? You can. I just don't recommend it. I like to mix the salt water in a barrel, make sure everything's right, and then pump that into my tank because we, if you have the tank filled with salt water and then you want to add sand or you want to add rock, you're going to end up with a huge cloud. You can't see anything. But if you have the sand in the tank first and then you pump the water in, the cloud is far less likely to happen. And same with the rock. You place the rock in the tank as you're, because it's going to displace water. You're going to have too much water in the system as you add sand and rock. So, and plus the salt mix, when you mix it up in a barrel or something, you'll notice there's like this film. Your whole tank will have that film. And you'll be trying to clean off the glass and the back of the tank and the overflow box because there's like this film everywhere. So yeah, I, I kind of prefer to mix it outside the tank, but you can mix it in the tank. It's just not what I would do. But now that you have a tank full of RODI water, why would you not? Hmm. Jazz asks, do you have any advice for digitate hydroids? You could put glue over the hole where they're coming out so they stop coming out. Uh, how many do you have? Do you have thousands? Do you have 10? Do you have one? It's kind of a cool critter. I had a couple in my tank, and I thought they were interesting. I never touched them. I let them just live. Wow. Okay, this is a good one. I live in San Diego, and I started using natural seawater, but it's low on alkalinity and calcium. 
So should I bring up those levels? It's uh, showing 7.6 DKH and 380 calcium. Yeah, they're both a little bit low for what I like. I, mean, I prefer high alkalinity. You know, I like my tank to be around 9. I kind of really want to be around 10. Uh, the general rule is if you have nutrients in your system like I do, which means I have nitrate and phosphate, you can have higher alkalinity. And when you have low nutrients, you're supposed to have low alkalinity. But when I say low, I'm thinking 8. But people out there are thinking 7. <laughs> That's really low. Um, I, I would bring it up a little bit myself. So if your natural seawater is a little bit low, you can definitely buffer it up. You're going to have to figure out that sweet math, like I need one teaspoon of calcium in every jug, five-gallon jug or something, and that way you'll know exactly what you need. It might be more than a teaspoon. It might be several. And it also depends what type you're using of calcium additive. Uh, ESV salt mix, pros and cons, or you haven't used it? I've never used that brand. I've used uh, ESV's Bionic to dose my tank for alkalinity and calcium, and, and uh, only those two, and uh, never used their salt mix. I've also never used Prodibio's salt mix, and yet the pictures on the bucket are actually pictures I took. So that's another salt I'd like to try at some point. Um, Reefer Madness says, is a gravity meter untrustworthy compared to a refractometer when it comes to the exact measurement of salinity? I don't know what a gravity meter is. Uh, I know a hydrometer, and I know a swing arm hydrometer, and I know a refractometer. I know a digital refractometer. Um, we have these salinity pens that are on the market by Icecap and Hanna. Uh, we have a salinity probe on the Apex and probably other brands like GHL more than likely. But... Uh, Really, no matter what you're measuring with, you've got to calibrate it. You've got, you can't just ignore it. And once you've calibrated it and you get it right, then you'll know what your measurements are, if your measurements are right. And you might discover you have stuff that's way off that you need to now bring up because of uh, things that were out of calibration. Can you dump salt water down the drain? Absolutely. Now, if you are in a home that has a septic system, you probably cannot. <laughs> Uh, most, a lot of people dump it right down the driveway and just let uh, it evaporate. <clears throat> and apparently they don't have like a lot of salt sitting on the driveway. You know, it's only 1.026. It's, it's not really salty, like salting the earth to prepare it against uh, ice and snow. So that's not anything to fear. Um, I've seen people that pour it uh, on their lawn and their grass seems to keep growing, which is interesting to me. Um, I used to use eye drops and I measured the salinity of the eye drops I used and it was like 1.026 like wow that's interesting so it's not like crazy salty like one might think um, okay I said baked baking soda raises alkalinity so you have to bake it first and I have an article on my website for you so I will get that for you guys really quick I think the easiest way to get to it. All the articles. And then probably in DIY. Oh, might be under chemistry. Just a second. Chemistry. Here we go. So this is the link. to make your own baked baking soda, or to make soda ash. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I thought I was letting you see what I'm looking at. Let me change that. So here is my make your own soda ash cheaply article. And it's just a box of baking soda from the store. Um, there's different kinds, there's just one brand at Aldi, but you can use the kind that exists at um, uh, Walmart. Kroger, you know, the Arm & Hammer, and you just want to bake it for about 45 minutes, 50 minutes, and then that will drive out the CO2 and then seal it up in a container. And then when you want to mix it, you can mix I even show how to mix it up to make a gallon solution or to do it teaspoon by teaspoon. So that should help you. All right.
Reefer Madness, it's a good thing that I don't do water changes. I've been in this house for 20 years. I should have no pipes left if what you say is true. Oh, if you're talking about the swing arm hydrometers, I, I'm not a fan of those. I actually had one and uh, was making a little bit of fun of it in one of my videos, and everyone just dogged the heck out of me on that one. They're like, you didn't use it right. How dare you put it down? I mean, it is the cheapest, flimsiest. They come for free in a bucket of salt. How accurate could it possibly be? And, uh, oh, man, I'd say 90% of the viewers that saw that video were mad at me. <laughs> And, you know, I opened the package for the first time in front of them and I poured the salt water in and it was leaking out the side. And I was like, I can't even fill this thing properly because it's busy pouring all over my desk. I was actually sitting in this spot when I did it. It was a big mess and I was just kind of mocking it because I was thinking most of us know don't use this thing. And yet uh, apparently everyone was using it and only I was the one not using that thing. But no, I don't use uh, swing arm hydrometers at all. Some fish stores do, uh, but they're not accurate. And can they be calibrated? Not sure. I know if air bubbles are in there, it can affect the reading. If it's not full enough, it can affect the reading. There's a lot of stuff. So I just don't recognize it. No, you may not use it without baking it. You absolutely must bake it. And it's not hard to do. Just do what my article said. I gave you guys the link. The reason that you bake the baking soda is to get the CO2 out of it. Because if you put baking soda in your water, it will lower the pH of your tank and you can lower it dangerously if you use too much because the CO2 is inside the media. So you definitely must bake it. All right. Ah, thank you for, for answering that question, Producer Reef. So it was at 11? That's a great number. Why would you lower it? <laughs> no, uh, you know. I mean, you're talking to a guy who's had really high alkalinity before. So 11 is like, that's within target between 8 and 11. So it's fine. But yeah, I see what you're doing. So you added some acid to lower it down. That's interesting. All right. Okay, this is a little different. I don't think we can compare the pipes in our home to the pipes in Alcatraz, the prison, which is in the middle of the ocean. I just... I'm not surprised everything was rusting there. That totally makes sense to me. So <laughs> I think that um, there's cast iron pipes, we've got PVC pipes, we've got copper pipes, you know. Yes, anything can and at some point will break. It definitely does. But I don't believe that putting salt water down your toilet or down your bathtub or down your kitchen sink is going to adversely destroy the plumbing of your home. I, I wouldn't tell that to people. Uh, the only ca caveat is if salt water goes into a septic system. I think it kills off the bacteria, which is why they don't recommend it go in there. That's what I think. I don't have a septic system, but I believe that's what I've read. Um, Arowana says, just one more thing. When cycling my tank, should I run the filter or keep it off and just leave uh, the, I'm assuming that was pumps and wave maker on. You want the water flowing through your tank during the cycle. Um, so you're going to want some kind of a power head or return pump. Uh, you're going to want a heater to keep the temperature stable. And you don't need to turn on any of the lights during the cycling. You can leave it off for a month. You don't need any lights and just let it cycle. I wouldn't filter it because you're cycling it. You want the ammonia to rise and rise and rise. And then you want to collapse back down to night, you know, to zero and nitrites shoot up and then they drop really quickly and then nitrates go up and then they come down. Then you can do a water change. Then you can turn on some filters. Um, then you can start looking at adding some kind of livestock gradually and then decide when to turn on the lights there after that. But I wouldn't uh, run the filters of any kind now. Now, when you are cycling a tank, there is a chance that your tank will smell bad, especially if the rock was uh, used live rock in the past and it, it was sitting out in the sun forever and you finally put you finally put in salt water and it starts to uh, basically it, it's releasing all the crap that's been in that stone for all this time and you might get this horrible smell in your home in that case the cure is to run carbon <clears throat> and it's a half a cup per 50 gallons and i always recommend to put carbon in a reactor and i have a video about that on this channel but the carbon will help remove the smell but it might make your cycle take longer because you're pulling stuff out with the carbon so you have to decide if you can just make it through a week or two of kind of an unpleasant smell. Maybe do something in the room to kind of 
make the room smell better or just like I said just wait it out but it'll take care of itself it won't stay like that forever Jay's crazy obsession says can I use a fresh can I use freshwater sand and lava rock in a fish only with live rock uh, lava rock has a chance there's metals in it and so we normally don't use that in a saltwater system but since it's fish only you might be okay uh, when you say freshwater sand I don't know what kind of sand that is we normally like to use aquarium sand so you probably could use a sand that's made for freshwater in a saltwater tank but I can't absolutely say for a fact because I don't know anything about freshwater products I would just say I like to use a sand that's made for aquariums never get something from Home Depot in a bag like play sand don't use that it's got metals in it and it will kill stuff but uh, you can use I like a aragonite based or calcium based sand in my aquarium and so that's what I do suggest don't know about that lava rock I think you're gonna be unhappy with it I think it might even be hard to keep clean too as algae starts growing on it The water softener won't affect your septic system. That's true. And uh, if you're running an RODI system, run it after the water softener so the RODI system can work less hard and it'll do a great job and your filters will last a lot longer. But yeah, it's interesting. You're talking about that going into the septic system. Hmm. Yeah. But I don't think I would add regular salt water. I think that the general rule is don't put your wastewater into your septic system from water changes. Um, I guess that's it. Let's uh, get into what we always do on Saturdays. It's water test Saturday. Be sure you test all your water parameters. And we want to make sure that everything is good. And you want to check your dosing pumps, make sure that the solutions are full, make sure the tubing where the dosing comes out is dripping in properly and not clogged. You can just roll the hose between your fingertip to break off any crusty parts so it starts to flow again hit the test button make sure it trickles test all three dosing pumps if you have three of them and then if that's all good to go make sure you clean your protein skimmer your riser neck of the body of the skimmer make sure your top off container is filled for the week and uh, that should pretty much take care of everything on your tank this week I'm gonna go work on mine I've got to fight some lights I got some stuff that's not working lately and I'm like oh got to deal with electronics are having problems but uh, I think that if we stay on top of our water testing, like it's our job rather than our hobby, I think your tank will do a lot better. And so I've been kind of emphasizing that that's something we absolutely must do. Just like at the public aquariums, they test their water every single day. They have employees with test kits and they have to measure everything and write the results on the wall. So when the boss comes in, they can see the water's been tested that day because they don't want to take any chances with their tanks. And those are public displays and they're big and they're a lot of work and our own tanks there are little displays. We want to make sure they look just as beautiful. So you want to stay on top of your testing. Do not procrastinate. It's so easy to do. Get the test kits out today. Use them. And uh, post your results. Post them in Club Meals Reef. We've got a great group on Facebook. And it's called Club Meals Reef. We've been going for over a year. We've got uh, over 5,000 members. And uh, we have really good, friendly conversations where we help each other with our tanks. And we share our success stories. We tell each other about, hey, here's something cool I printed with a 3D printer that made my tank better than before. Um, when we have questions or problems, we share that. We ask, you know, does this look normal? Is there a problem? And it's a great group. I highly recommend it. I know that uh, we definitely have a back and forth here on the live streams every Saturday. But I would just like to invite you to come join the group because that's all week long. And I definitely post in there. I also post on Milo's Reef on Facebook. This is my business page on there, and I share something interesting on there every single day. And sometimes I will take that item and push it into the club, but sometimes I don't. So be sure you follow that page as well. Um, and we this week we had a couple of really cool things that I shared. One was about someone that makes fish art out of lumber. He's repurposing it and doing beautiful work and has a whole gallery of things he's done. 
And I shared another really cool story. Um, I'm trying to remember what it was right now. I think it had to do with spawning. But yeah, so be sure that you're following those two things or be participants in because they are here for you so that you can be a happy reefer. Anyway, that's it, guys. Thanks so much, and I will catch up with you guys in a week. Bye.